This month sees the 80th anniversary of the Battle of Britain, which we are commemorating with this film. In Smarden, we have several recorded aircraft crash sites, most of them from the Second World War, located at Vesper Hawk, Langley, Buckman and Deering Farms, to name just a few. In addition, there were a number of unrecorded accidents at the temporary airfields built around Smarden, such as Lash and Den, seen here from 1940 RAF camera footage. The Tisha Rathbone recounts seeing a pilot parachuting onto the Minis in our film Wartime Memories of Smarden, also on YouTube. But we are going to focus on just four incidents and take a closer look at the lives of the pilots who flew those planes. Here are the planes we are going to talk about and we begin with the story of two civilian aircraft which came down in Smarden in 1929 and 1931. Let's start by explaining why there have been so many flying accidents in Smarden and in this part of Kent generally. This map from World War I shows the flight paths taken by a squadron of German bombers on an aborted raid on London in 1917 when the planes took off from an airfield in northern France and, as you can see, they flew directly over mid-Kent as they would again in World War II. Then there is the rail track running in a straight line from Folkestone to Tunbridge. In the early days of commercial flying, pilots used this as a navigational aid on their routes between London and Paris. In foggy conditions, steam trains left furrows in the fog, which pilots could follow, and the names of each station were painted on the roofs as another aid to navigation. This painting by artist Bill Perrin makes the point by depicting two hurricanes following the rail track in the headcorn direction along the Smarden Road. Straight after the end of World War I, commercial flights were established between Hounslow, Croydon and Le Bourget outside Paris. On this route, the subsidised French Air Union Company captured 70% of passenger and 90% of freight market, while the British Imperial Airways struggled to compete with its Silver Wings service. Air travel was becoming increasingly luxurious but expensive. In today's money, a two and a half hour flight cost about a thousand pounds. By 1926, Air Union was making five round trips every day, and that year carried 7,700 passengers. Planes had a crew of two, with the pilot seated in an open cockpit. They could seat 12 people and offered eight course meals, and its lists of drinks included champagne and red and white Bordeaux. One early problem was that until 1921, 
no reliable meteorological information was available. The other was that the aircraft at that time were notoriously unreliable. One plane flying between London and Paris had to make no fewer than 22 forced landings. So now let's take a look at the first Smarden crash, which took place on the 31st of July 1929. The aircraft was developed from a French bomber, the Farman Goliath. A writer once referred to Kent as the Goliath's graveyard. Here's the record. Here's the plane which later crashed in Smarden. After takeoff from Croydon, the plane developed engine trouble and the pilot decided to make an emergency landing, coming to rest by the river belt, stopped only by the bushes. However, the plane was carrying gold bullion from London to Paris and on impact, the boxes shot out of the front of the aircraft and into the river. The pilot tried unsuccessfully to claim that the boxes only contained ballast, but the good folk of Smarden were there to lend a hand and loaded the gold onto a lorry and onto Lim Airfield for onward transport to Paris. Here are some fascinated youngsters posing at the front of the plane. Two years later, on 17th of January, 1931, a plane piloted by Monsieur Bart and carrying six passengers crash-landed at Lim Airfield. Bart was treated in Folkestone Hospital and two days later he boarded a Golden Ray, also carrying gold, as a passenger on the return flight to Paris. But this plane developed engine trouble and made a forced landing in Smarden. The unlucky Monsieur Bart again suffered minor cuts. This picture frame, now in our archive, is made from a part of the crashed aircraft. Here's the fed up looking French mechanic, presumably having been told to stay with the plane and guard the plane's precious cargo. A couple of months later, the head of Air Union made a somewhat inaccurate claim in a speech at Croydon, but was better informed when he predicted the future of transatlantic flights at 500 miles an hour at an altitude of seven miles. Two years later, Monsieur Bart's plane, now repaired and flying again, was again in trouble, when it caught fire mid-air and had to make another crash landing near Amiens. The terrified passengers and crew just made it out of the plane before the tanks exploded. going to move on now to the Battle of Britain and tell you the stories of two pilots, 
one of them Canadian, the other German, who both fought in the skies over Smarden. September the 15th, 1940, is remembered as Battle of Britain Day, when 1,500 German planes assaulted targets in the southeast of England, including an attack on Buckingham Palace. 26-year-old Hans Bertel was flying a Messerschmitt in the elite J-52 squadron. Their nickname was the Experts, as they were the most successful German fighter wing of World War II. You can still buy J-52 memorabilia today. Bertel was something of a celebrity and his Messerschmitt was designated Red One in recognition of him shooting down a French bomber, the first plane to penetrate German airspace on October the 6th, 1939. This photograph of his squadron was taken at the beginning of the war. By the end of the Battle of Britain, only four of these men were left. The Luftwaffe operated a fly till you die policy. No pilots were rotated or withdrawn into training roles, regardless of how many missions they had flown. On the 15th of September, he was engaged in a dogfight over Kent when he was in a mid-air collision with a hurricane which crashed onto Staplehurst Station, killing the young ticket office clerk. Bertel ejected from his aircraft and parachuted down into Smarden, where he was taken prisoner. With the threat of invasion still very real, German prisoners of war were being transported to Canada and Bertel found himself at Camp 30 at Bowmanville north of Lake Ontario. Having a theatrical background, he organised performances for the prisoners. He was also involved in an abortive escape attempt by tunnel. He was there in 1942 when 500 club-wielding prisoners took over the camp for three days with a mass brawl known as the Battle of Bowmanville. After the war, Bertel went to Hollywood as artistic director in the 1960 film about German V2 rocket scientist Werner von Braun, titled I Aim at the Stars, but renamed by the WAGs as I Sometimes Hit London. In all, Bertel had 20 movie credits to his name and went on to make a number of TV documentaries. He died in Munich in 2000. A few weeks after Bertel's plane came down, a Canadian pilot parachuted into Woodland in Smarden. The pilot's name was Hartland Molson. Molson was born in 1907 and was the great-great-great-grandson of a gentleman brewer named John Molson, who had emigrated to Canada from Lincolnshire in 1782. Hartland earned his wings in April 1940 and flew 62 missions. Aged 33, he was the oldest pilot in his squadron. On his final day in action, on the 5th of October, he was over Canterbury in his hurricane when he engaged two Messerschmitts. After damaging the wing of one, his aircraft was attacked from behind. Seconds later, his control panel disintegrated and he was hit three times in the leg. He bailed out in free fall, waiting for the German fighters to disappear before opening his parachute at 7,000 feet. Whilst descending, he tried to use the ripcord as a tourniquet and finally came to land in a wood in Smarden. He wrote, I hobbled about 30 yards to a wide path and sat down. Then I started to call every minute or so. Soon I heard an answer and about 10 minutes from landing, half a dozen cockney soldiers were mothering me wonderfully. Too old at 33 to return to his squadron, 
he was repatriated to Canada, where he went on a speaking tour. Later he held a number of important commands in the Canadian Air Force and was awarded an OBE in 1946 for his wartime leadership and service. At home in Montreal, the family business was the huge Molson Brewery Empire, where he became president. He was appointed to the Senate of Canada, where he served until his retirement age, 75, in 1993. Molson supported many causes, dispensing over $120 million in grants from his foundation, and was made an Officer of the Order of Canada and the National Order of Quebec, which is the highest civilian honour of his country. Hartland Molson passed away on September 28, 2002, the last in the line of brave aviators who are still remembered today in the village where they came to land all those years ago. Mm -hmm.